What's up guys, my name is Mark Steiner and today we are going to be comparing the Sony 35mm 1.4 G Master to the Sigma 35mm 1.4 Art Lens. Let's get right into it. Let's start with the physical traits of these lenses. The Sigma has great build quality with a nice big rubber focus ring, a focus window, and an AF MF switch on the side. Since the lens is an adapted DSLR lens, it uses a mechanical focusing system which is more accurate when manual focusing. The lens is definitely not the lightest, coming in at 755 grams. The most notable difference between these two lenses is the size and weight. The Sony is significantly smaller and weighs a mere 524 grams. It features the usual things you'd expect on a Sony GM lens like a custom function button, an AF MF switch, and a declickable aperture ring. Unlike the Sigma, the Sony is fully weather sealed with a rubber gasket on the back. Both of these lenses use the 67mm filter size. The Sony 35mm has the new linear AF motor, which means it's going to have smooth and ultra quick focusing. It also means that compared to previous focus by wire systems, it is much easier and more reliable to manually pull focus. The Sony has a minimum focusing distance of 25cm versus the 30cm of the Sigma, which means you can get closer to your subject with the Sony. Now onto the IAF test. IAF on both of these lenses performs very well. Wide open, there is little to no difference in the photo tracking capabilities of these lenses. The Sony seems to focus on the background a little bit smoother than the Sigma, but both stick to the eye like glue and are very reliable. I do know that if you're going to be pairing these lenses with a Sony A1 or future faster shooting camera models, you are going to be getting more frames per second with the Sony because of its faster AF speed. But since I'm using a camera that maxes out at 10 frames per second, there is no difference for me right now. On to the video AF test. The biggest difference right off the bat that I see is that the Sigma has a different color rendering than the Sony. As I backpedal, both both lenses do a good job of keeping me in focus, with the Sony holding on to me a little bit longer than the Sigma as I get further away. As I run towards the camera, the Sony seems to do a better job of keeping critical, sharp focus, whereas the Sigma seems to almost achieve it and then attempt again in a stepping motion as I get closer, but I am just out of focus the entire way until I come to a complete stop. When focusing on the background, the Sony is both faster and smoother, but the Sigma is not that far behind. When I come back into frame, both lenses get me instantly. As I get out of frame, the Sigma is significantly slower transitioning focus this time. When I come back into frame, both lenses transition pretty quickly, but the Sony seems to achieve critical focus slightly faster. This time, it's the Sigma that transitions faster, but again, the Sony seems to achieve critical focus faster, as the Sigma seems to have a curve in its focus speed. When I come back in, the Sony is noticeably faster at getting me in focus, as well as noticeably faster at transitioning to the background. When I come back up, both lenses are quick to get me back in focus. As I backpedal, both lenses do a good job of keeping me in focus until I hit about the red circle, where the Sigma loses my face first, and then the Sony, completely focusing on the background. As I run towards the camera, both lenses don't recognize my face until I'm more than halfway towards the camera with the Sony snapping into focus first, and the Sigma not that far behind. After the snap, both lenses do a good job of keeping me in focus, with the Sigma just being a little softer throughout until I come to a complete stop. Let's talk about focus breathing, because this is the biggest issue with the Sony 35mm. The Sigma does suffer from focus breathing as well, but throughout the last three years of me owning this lens, I've never really noticed the focus breathing of the Sigma, and focus breathing in general has never really been an issue for me and the way that I shoot. However, with the Sony 35mm G Master, the focus breathing is actually noticeable. As you can see here, it literally looks like I'm zooming in and out when I'm simply focusing the lens. That can definitely be cool as it adds a unique effect, but I don't want that effect on every single shot. And when I was using this lens out in the field shooting video, I noticed that because of the focus breathing, when it was focusing on a subject, the framing would kind of punch in and it would look a little jarring, even though the focus was fine. Now on to some photo tests. We have the Sony on the right side, the Sigma on the left side, and you can see the settings that we shot this at in the top left corner. If we zoom in here, you can see that even wide open, the Sony is significantly sharper. There's just so much more detail. You can see the individual dust particles. You can see the lens cap texture and everything just seems a little bit softer on the Sigma. And then we go up to the text and you can see that there's just like this glowing effect on the Sigma and it looks a little bit softer, more filmic. 
it has that green chromatic aberration around the text here and you're seeing some green chromatic aberration on the text of the Sony as well but it's not as pronounced and honestly for me chromatic aberration has never been that big of a deal when it comes to these kind of lenses because you can fix that in post. Now if we zoom into the bokeh on the actual camera because of the textured grip you can see the difference in bokeh here. On the Sigma you're getting this like ball within a ball onion kind of shape going and it just looks a lot more busy. There's definitely that green chromatic aberration cast around the bokeh there, which I find very interesting. And you have the same green on the Sony over here, which I also find very interesting. They're similar in that way. But the Sony does seem a little more crisp, a little sharper, and less busy. You're not getting that ball within a ball type bokeh. You're getting a very clean type bokeh, very circular. On to the next example. When we stop these lenses down to f2.8, you can see that the Sony, the chromatic aberration cleans up a bit. It is still significantly sharper. It looks great. The Sigma cleans up quite nicely at f2.8. It's very nice, significantly sharper, more detail, gets rid of a lot of that chromatic aberration and softness. But again, we go over to the bokeh and the Sigma just looks so much more busy because of that ball within a ball and the green is a little bit more apparent, whereas that's, there's this nicer fall off with the Sony, it looks less busy. And, but again, you know, that's zooming in at like 300%, but there's significantly more sharpness around the photo. The Sony actually seems to have a little bit more of that green cast on this white writing, which I find very interesting. But again, for me, chromatic aberration isn't that bad, especially in photos, because you can edit it out in Lightroom. Let's move on to some more real world tests. As you can see, when we zoom in, both lenses perform very, very well. There's very little difference in sharpness and quality. The Sony does seem a little bit sharper, but for the most part, no one's really gonna notice any difference, especially since we're zoomed in at like 400% right now, which is kind of crazy. They both look really, really good. I wouldn't say one is significantly better over the other. Uh, the color rendering in her skin might seem a tad bit more natural on the Sony compared to the Sigma. There's a little bit more magenta in her skin tones there, but I really wouldn't say that the the color rendering is that different. The Sony seems to be a little bit more vibrant, seems to be a tad bit nicer, but I was intrigued to see that the colors aren't drastically different. If we look at the blue here in the sky, the blue is fairly similar, but it does seem to be a little bit better on the Sony. I don't know what it is that Sony tweaked this lens to make the colors just look a little bit better, but overall these images look very, very similar and it, it's kind of hard to tell which is shot with which. If you took away the information at the top, I wouldn't be able to tell you what lens shot what photo, so it just goes to show that they're actually pretty similar. But if we zoom in to her shirt right here, you can see that the Sony is just a little bit sharper. There's more detail. You can see the stitching patterns a little bit more, whereas on the Sigma, it's more of a blurred mess. You can still make it out in certain areas, but there's just that extra added bit of sharpness on the Sony, which I find very interesting. Now that I'm looking at this though, they both have a little bit of that purple fringing on the highlights of her arm, which I think is very interesting. Again, not that big of a deal when it comes to chromatic aberration, easily fixable in post. Speaking of corner sharpness and lens corrections, if we go to the Sigma, you can see when we turn on lens corrections, there's a little bit of vignetting as well as a little bit of barrel distortion, which is perfectly fine. I actually really like the vignetting of this lens, so I usually keep it at zero because it adds a nice punch to the subject. And then if we move over to the Sony, and you can see when we turn the lens corrections on for the Sony, there's a little bit of pin cushion distortion and quite a bit of vignetting, which I found very, very very surprising and again I like to have that vignette and it adds a really nice quality to the image so I like having that natural vignette going on but if you don't you can turn it off it really does brighten up the image it makes a huge difference but I really like how this lens looks. On the Sigma, there is significantly less deal on the edges of the frame, which is to be expected, that's normal. But if we go back to the Sony, there's actually quite a bit of sharpness and detail on the edges of the frame, so that looks really, really good. It doesn't look as less detailed compared to the Sigma, which is just kind of a mess, but that's all right, because you know, if you're trying to frame your <laughs> image at the edge of the frame, you're probably doing something wrong. But you know, at the end of the day, the Sony is optically superior compared to the Sigma. But in real world tests, are you really going to notice that? Probably not.
All right, onto the final real world photo comparison between these two lenses. If we zoom in here, again, they both look plenty sharp. I wouldn't say that one has the advantage over the other. They both look really, really good. The skin tones look good, eyes are sharp. It's genuinely difficult to say that one lens is better than the other in terms of sharpness and image quality in real world situations. However, when we move on to bokeh, you can see there's quite a big difference in how bokeh is rendered between the Sony and the Sigma. The Sigma has that onion ring going on and again that ball within a ball thing, whereas the Sony is just straight balls of light. They're not perfectly circular, but I've noticed this on a lot of Sony lenses. They get more oval on the edges of the frame and then as you get closer to the center of the frame they become more perfectly circular. And you see that on the Sigma as well. If we look right here, more circular and here close to circular, so you're getting very similar kinds of bokeh from edge to center, but the actual bokeh rendering is a little bit different, and I actually prefer the Sony in this case. The Sigma just looks a little bit more busy, and when you zoom out, you might not be able to tell what it is, but yeah, the Sigma just has... I don't know, because that ball within a ball, it just looks busier, but it also has this like kind of filmic quality to it, you know? Like, a lot of these older lenses have imperfections like that and they, they kind of have that character to the lens. Whereas the Sony seems more technically perfect, which is kind of nice, but also do you want technically perfect bokeh or do you want bokeh with character? And I think that's personal preference. There's no right answer there. I think between the two, I prefer the Sony. It just looks better in my opinion, but both look really nice. Let's go back to our sharpness test in her shirt that's lit properly. Again, as you can see, there's just far more detail in the Sony lens, you can see the actual stitching patterns here on her shirt versus more of a blurred, mushy, less detailed version on the Sigma. So the Sony is sharper in that sense, and you can see that throughout. There's just, there's just more detail in the more intricate parts of the image. Again, you go to the jacket, you can see the actual texture of her jacket, that felt versus more of like a blurred, mushy mess on the Sigma. Because I've had the opportunity to test out so many different 35mm lenses for the Sony E-mount, I know exactly what I'm looking for in a lens and how it compares to the competition. When I first bought the Sigma 35mm 1.4 art lens for Sony E-mount, it was back when it first came out in 2019, and the competition at the time was really the Zeiss Distagon and the 2.8 pancake lens. Neither of those lenses were really good, and they didn't represent a good value for the price you were paying. Then came the Sony 35mm 1.8, and that lens was absolutely incredible. I feel like it should have been a little bit cheaper. I wish it was a little bit bigger and it didn't have such a weird filter thread size of 55mm. But hey, great lens, that's pretty much exactly what everyone was asking for a 35mm 1.8. But then we got the Sony 35mm 1.4. G Master. And for me, this is where things get a little bit complicated because yes, this Sony 35mm is the best optical 35mm available for Sony E-mount. And I was expecting great things from this. And don't get me wrong, it's a, it's a great lens. Absolutely recommend it. However, I was expecting it to absolutely blow out the Sigma in every aspect, but especially in video autofocus. And to my surprise, the Sigma <laughs> actually kept right up there with it. The difference wasn't enough for me to think that the Sony was that far superior. So I started thinking, is the 35mm G Master worth it? And I think for photographers, most definitely. It has so many advantages over the Sigma that it makes it a much better lens. But for hybrid shooters such as myself who need it for both photo and video, it becomes a different question. Are you willing to spend $1,400 on the G Master? And for me, I don't think it's worth double the price over the Sigma lens, especially now that Sigma has that brand new version of this art lens out that has fixes a lot of the issues with this one. So for me, the G Master is in this weird position because it's, it's very expensive. It's the creme de la creme, but is it worth double the price? And I think that depends. Do you appreciate the small size and weight that the Sony G Master offers? Do you appreciate the fact that it has all these extra coatings and it just performs optically so well? Do you appreciate that it's completely and utterly weather sealed and that you have a lens that you can wholeheartedly rely on in any professional circumstance? Or would you rather pay half the price 
and get pretty much, I don't know, 98% of the performance, and then, you know, 80% of the goodness from weather sealing and other professional capabilities, in a lens that is very, very similar, that weighs a little bit more. I think for most people, the Sigma is still the way to go because it, it's so similar in so many ways to the G Master in terms of performance that it's hard to justify paying double the amount for the G Master. But where the G Master makes sense to me is future-proofing. With the existence of the A1, we're seeing 30 frames per second stills as well as 8K video, and I'm sure in the near future we're going to be seeing 100 megapixel plus sensors, and this lens is going to need to be able to resolve that resolution as well as keep up with those AF speeds. And if the A1 is anything to go off of, the AF is just absolutely ridiculous on that camera, and I feel like that will resolve my biggest issue with this lens, which is the focus breathing. When I was out in the field shooting video with this lens, I could tell the focus breathing because of my autofocus settings. There's this like little jump that would happen and I wasn't the biggest fan. But the autofocus system on the A1 is so good and so accurate and so fast, it looks like you have a professional focus puller with you, and I feel like that would be able to compensate and kind of negate the focus breathing issue I have with this lens. And again, that's future-proofing, right? When you put it on a more powerful camera, it's going to perform better. And I think that is where I would say definitely, most definitely, get the 35mm G Master over the Sigma. The other big thing when it comes to future-proofing is those frames per second in still mode. With the Sony A1, this lens is actually able to get up to that 30 frames per second, whereas the Sigma, I think, is between like 10 and 14 frames. So you're losing like a third to half of the autofocusing capability of a high-end camera when you pair it with a third-party lens. And I think those people who are in the highest end bracket who need that performance, the G Master is the way to go. And even us who, you know, maybe looking at the A7 IV or A7 V or A7 R5 or A7 R6, like down the line, the 35mm G Master is a better investment when those cameras can actually catch up to the autofocusing capabilities of this thing. I will say that the image quality out of this lens in the real world is absolutely phenomenal. It's just so beautiful. I shot an entire model portrait video with this, so check that out if you want. I shot an entire photo shoot with this one as well, so check that out. But in my experience, that portrait video that I shot, the color rendering, the flaring, the shadows, the detail, just everything that I shot with this lens just looked so clean. And I know for a fact, because I've been shooting with the Sigma for three years, that I wouldn't be able to get that same sort of quality out of the Sigma as I did the G Master. And when I was color grading, just like skin tones looked better, just everything was that extra bit of crispness with better detail, better color rendering, I loved it. So what are my final thoughts on this lens? I absolutely love this lens, but I also can't help but feel some mixed feelings towards it. For $1,400, I was expecting it to absolutely demolish the competition, but the competition is right up there with it at half the price. So for me, it's hard to justify double the price for very, very similar performance. And I think most people will see the price of the G Master and see the price of the Sigma and lean towards the Sigma for what you get. But I think if you're the professional who requires the creme de la creme, the best of the best, the G Master is the way to go. If you're only a photographer, the G Master is the way to go. If you're a hybrid shooter, that focus breathing does come into play. I think it is something that you need to be aware of because it will affect your videos, especially if you pull focus manually. But I think, again, if you're thinking with the mentality of future proofing and autofocus systems getting even better or using the A1, the G Master is probably the way to go as well. But as always, I want to know what you guys think. Do you think the G Master is worth it? Do you think the Sigma is the play? Let me know in the comment section down below. My name is Mark Steiner, and I'll see you next time.